It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you take control of the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Tuesday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, or if you're joining us on the YouTube channel, your first watch every day. It is time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you send in questions, comments, takes, whatever you have, and I respond to them here on the podcast. We have some great stuff to get into. Let's get started. And quickly, as a reminder, if you want to have an item addressed on Herd Mentality, the best way to get that to me is on Twitter. Shoot me a DM at the Joe Marino. You can also send me an email, joe at thedraftnetwork.com. First one today comes from Matthew, who says, how do the Bills stack up in the AFC if, God forbid, Josh gets an injury this year? What is the ceiling with Case Keenum? It's a good question. And obviously, I don't want to live in a world where Josh Allen isn't the Bills' starting quarterback. But the good news is they have a really nice backup player in Case Keenum that can come in and play at a reasonable level. And in fact, he's had some really good seasons in the NFL. He was 11-3, and or the Vikings were 11-3 and as the starting quarterback in 2017 with Case Keenum. The Browns last year were 2-0. and with Case Keenum. Now he had a six and ten run with Denver in 2018. He had a one and seven stretch with the Washington football team in 2019. So that really hurt his career. But he's 29 and 35 as a starting quarterback. And that includes a seven and seventeen stretch with Denver and Washington in 2018 and 2019. And an 0 and 8 stretch in 2013 as a rookie with the Houston Texans. So there's a, a pretty pretty big chunk of his starting experience. We're just in bad situations, but he's had some decent stretches. 2014, 2-0. 2015, 3-2 with the Rams. 2016, 4-5 with the Rams. 11-3 in 2017 with the Vikings. Then the 6-10 with Denver. 1-7 with Washington. 2-0 with Cleveland last year. And obviously, I think the Bills roster is the best of any that he's been on. And so I'm not going to sit here and say that, wow, you know, he went 11 and three with the Vikings in 2017. Everything is fine. I'm not saying that. But I think the Bills could still challenge to win the AFC East. And I would expect them to still be a playoff team with Case Keenum. I think you're talking about a nine or a 10 win team with Case Keenum as a starting quarterback. And I think that gets you to the postseason. Now, hopefully, if Josh goes down, it's for just a few weeks. And. You just get by and you have a decent little stretch with Case as opposed to a long extended season. But I don't think the Bills' season is completely derailed. The expectations change. It goes from, hey, we kind of expect this team to compete for the number one seed and, and probably win the AFC, right? Those are kind of the expectations for this Bills team. I think you you back off a little bit with Case Keenum, but you're still going to go out and have a good season. Next one today comes from Harry, who says, You hypothesized in the Athletic Breakdown podcast that Tommy Doyle could potentially be a long-term option at guard. But I remember you mentioned this year's six-round pick, Luke Tenuta, was too tall for guard. Just wondering the distinction between the two very tall linemen. My guess is athleticism. This is a great question. It really is. And I would have said the same thing last year about Tommy Doyle. I probably did say the same thing last year about Tommy Doyle. I do believe that six foot eight is too tall to play guard. However, because Tommy Doyle is actually getting reps at guard right now, it's opened up my eyes. I don't think it's going to be his best position. I think he's going to fight his frame a lot, trying to play with bend and leverage on the inside. But Aaron Cromer's given him a shot to play guard. We know that based on the minicamp reports to this point. So 
that's why I'm not dismissing it. Generally speaking, I do believe 6'8 is way too tall to play guard. But Tommy Doyle is getting that opportunity. And as we consider something I've talked about a lot with, you know, Roger Saffold being a one-year thing at guard for the Bills, you start to think, what about 2023 and beyond that guard opposite Orion Bates? And if Tommy Doyle is getting chances now, I'm not going to eliminate him as a possibility just given how gifted he is as an athlete and that he's getting an opportunity. So I do think there's a chance that Tommy Doyle could be the Bills' long-term guy at at guard just given the coaching that's available to him with Aaron Cromer and his physical upside. Harry had a second part of his question. He said, I'm enjoying the YouTube version of the podcast. Thank you. The Bills swag game is elite. You mind sharing your thought process for selecting Bills swag? Appreciate this question. Uh, I would say three things in response to, I guess, my Bills swag game. First of all, I look all the time. I'm always in the market for new Bills stuff. And so I am I shop around for it a lot. And because of that, like my phone knows this. And so it makes a lot of suggestions. And I've purchased a lot of things that my phone suggested to me because it's aware of my internet behavior, if you will. Right? I'm sure you guys all understand that. Number two is always check out 26 shirts. Del Reed and those guys, they put out some really cool stuff. Um, you know, stuff that you just can't find anywhere else. Like, for example, the Bison King shirt that I have on right now, courtesy of 26 shirts. I think this thing is awesome. I saw it and I said I have to have it and ordered it. And they have so many other great shirts, and I have a lot of them. So check out 26 search, 26 shirts. And then the third piece of advice that I have is don't go with the volume approach. I remember being younger, and if it had a Bill's logo on it, I wanted to have it. Don't do that. Only buy stuff that you really, really like. And that way you won't just have this dull Bill stuff on. You will have good Bill stuff on that you actually like. So if it has a Bill's logo on it, that doesn't mean you have to have it. Only get stuff that you actually like and will wear and will want to wear. So be in the market. Don't forget about 26 shirts and do not do the volume thing. You wind up with some really boring T-shirts that just have a logo or just say Bill's on them. And there are times that that could look good if it's textured and if it is like kind of a clean look, I can, I can appreciate that, but don't just get something to get something because it has a Bills logo on it. Stay away from the fan packs, the three t-shirts for $25 or whatever. That stuff, you're not going to be happy with that. Go in and get actually good stuff that you like and will wear and will want to wear. The next one comes from Andre. I love this one. Andre says, now that the draft crunch is over, when do we get back to the important stuff like advocating for the Bills to get rid of the black striping on the shoulders and around the numbers on their uniform? You brought it up last year, and I can't unsee it. Just an ugly, unnecessary flourish. I think bringing back the red helmet, which I support as an alternative, is distracting the fan base from the bigger aesthetic problem. All right, I appreciate you bringing this up. First of all, I'm a big uniforms guy. I, I talk uniforms all the time. Uh at any level of football, I'm always interested in what teams are wearing and what what the aesthetic is, and you know how they work together, their color combinations, and those types of things. And I have strong uniform takes when it comes to the NFL, right? Like I think there's some really atrocious uniforms out there. I think the Bills overall have an elite NFL uniform, elite. All right, but it does have two problems, and Andre alluded to one of them. Let's talk about one of those problems, and I have some props here that I can show you if you're on YouTube. This is um, me using props. If you're listening in the regular podcast form, well, then I'll do my best to explain it. But what I have right here is a Bills jersey, all right? And this is going to show you exactly what I've talked about and what Andre has brought up today. As you can see on this jersey, and you see the stripes, there is a black stripe outside of this red stripe, which I find to be completely unnecessary, and it really kind of muddies up the look a little bit. And if you look at the numbers as well, so I'll show you the number. This is kind of hard to do. There's the five on the front of this jersey. You can see the black outline, okay? To me, that is just unnecessary. And maybe you can see it talking through my jersey, right? That's obviously not great. But can you see? You, you know what I'm talking about. There's a black outline outside of that red outline. To me, it's just unnecessarily muddy. And when I, I just think it's a very simple fix. Like, you just get rid of it. You just have 
the red stripe. And I'm going to show you the throwback uniforms right now. Here it is on your screen. You see how there's no black outline on those numbers and how clean that looks and how the red really pops? To me, the black really doles out the red. And so to me, this is just a really easy way to fix this. Get rid of that black stripe around the stripes around the sh- you know the shoulders and of course the numbers as well. Just get rid of it. It's unnecessary. It doesn't bring anything to the uniform and it doles out the red and even the blue. I think that you get rid of it, that red will pop. It'll look even better. The second thing that the Bills need to do, and I know that not everybody agrees with me on this, but it's on the helmet. So I have a Bills helmet right here. Okay. Beautiful, gorgeous helmet. We love it. The white face masks, elite. It has one flaw in this helmet. It's that this stripe on the back, it widens, okay? And I find this to be extremely unnecessary. Now, I've heard that it has something to do with the stripe on the logo, right? Like the stripe on the logo, it somewhat widens, but this gets kind of an exaggerated widen. So I just don't think that this black, or excuse me, this red stripe needs to widen on the back. Just give me the same width all the way across. And also, I don't know if you can see it, but get rid of the black stripe there as well. You get rid of that black stripe, everything is going to pop better when it comes to that blue and that red. So two very minor fixes, but that's the only thing. Like the Bills uniforms are elite, but they're not perfect. Those are the two things that they can do to make them absolutely perfect. And um, I'd be interested if you guys agree with me. I know some of you guys like that widened stripe on the back of the helmet. I'm not a fan, and I'm obviously not a fan of the unnecessary black striping around the shoulders and the numbers. Whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. You can create and build the engagement ring of her dreams. Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as uh, setting style. And Blue Nile has jewelers that will then handcraft her perfect engagement ring, making sure that each ring is one of a kind. Or maybe you just want to celebrate life's special moments with fine jewelry. If you're looking for jewelry but having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7 available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports listeners Get $50 off purchases of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive includes engagement rings. Use code locked on. That's code locked on. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress free and find your forever peace. Go to bluenile.com today. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions like, is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? And wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and save money when using Rock Auto. Why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? They have everything you can need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. They have amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need over at rockauto.com. The next one today comes from Sumit, who says, Big fan of the podcast. Question about Josh Allen. I'm as big a fan as anyone, but do you think we are unfairly weighing his unbelievable 2021 playoff performances as compared to the regular season? According to Bruce Nolan's QB Stu score, Allen was barely a top 10 regular season quarterback last season. For us to get to the promised land, we will need Josh to play at a top five level through the regular season to ensure home field in the playoffs, ultimately increasing our overall chances. In addition, what do you think will be the biggest reason he will take the step this season? Was it a better supporting cast, a possible upgrade in the offensive coaching room, et cetera? Fair points here, Sumit. This is what I'll say, and I've, I've alluded to this multiple times on the podcast, but I think the Bills last year, and I said this so many times, I think the Bills 
up until about week 12 last year, they were what I would call an entitled football team. They showed up and they expected games to go a certain way. And it was very much, we're the best team, we should win, and we expect that to happen. And those are good things to think, but I think it affected their execution and their urgency. They didn't start fast a lot of times last year. And Josh Allen was was guilty with this. And I think part of this is, and you could sense this from some of the messaging that you heard from Josh Allen and Sean McDermott later during the season, is that they were very much get to the playoffs and get to the playoffs healthy. Where if you go back to 2020, you know, the Bills were an awesome football team, 13 and 3, went to the AFC Championship game, but Cole Beasley was banged up. Stefan Diggs played injured in the playoffs. They had some injuries on the offensive line. The linebackers, Milano and Edmonds, were kind of banged up last year. And I think it was very much like, let's get through the regular season to get to the playoffs. And we feel like we can, you know, we're the best team. We'll turn it on. And that's kind of what they did last year. But I think not having a higher seed and not really being able to secure that number one seed impacted things. And now you start to wonder, man, would the Bills have lost twice in a row in the playoffs to the Chiefs if both games didn't have to be in Kansas City? And so I think the Bills took some, th- some things for granted last year. I really do. And I think they'll be better for it. But the reason that I'm not, like, I, I just, when you say factoring the regular season and some of the inconsistency there and then, you know, kind of really buying into the playoffs and what Josh was there, we know what Josh can do. The sample size over the last two seasons, including the playoffs, tells us exactly who Josh Allen is in the NFL. He's one of the elite players, right? One of the best three or four players in the entire NFL. I just think it comes down to a little bit more urgency and not taking anything for granted during the regular season because you want to get to the postseason, but you got to get to the postseason in the best possible position to go all the way. And I think the Bills understand that, and I think you'll see a different level of urgency this coming season. I don't think you'll see that team being so entitled like I believe they were multiple times last year. George says, I'm still nervous entering the season with Trey White, still not able to perform at a high level and having a rookie corner starting as well. Given the caliber of the quarterbacks and wide receivers we will see early in the season, should the Bills have gone out and gotten a veteran corner by now? Should we, should we be worried that our schedule is so tough out of the gate? Sure. Yeah, I think so. And this is when we reflected uh, on the the schedule when it first came out, I had an entire like segment of the Trey White factor and Trey White not being available early in the season and the implications and some of those really good teams on the schedule where you just wish you had Trey White and Trey White in the version that we know him. So yeah, that's definitely a concern. The silver lining is that you do have a really talented young player in Kyer Elam. You do have a player now in Dane Jackson that is experienced, that has time on task, you know, that you feel somewhat good about being able to step in and be a solid starter. But yeah, I mean, if Trey White's not ready to go, I wish the Bills had more depth. I wish they would still sign a Joe Hayden or an A.J. Bouye. And maybe that'll happen. I think you've seen some level of activity pick up across the NFL with players signing now that we're after June 1st and players don't count towards the comp pick formula and there's different cap implications based on signing them pre and post June 1st, all that type of stuff. So I think the window's there. And I and look, maybe all of this is just us not having all the information and the Bills knowing, hey, Trey White's going to be ready to go for week one, there's nothing to be concerned about. And the the closer they get to it and don't make a move at corner, the more I'm inclined to believe that's the case. So maybe that's our silver lining. But if Trey White's not ready to go for week one, please give me A.J. Bouye or Joe Hayden on this roster. Dan says, I loved watching those quarterbacks duke it out on the golf course, but with that subpar performance, pun intended, what are the chances that we get to see Josh Allen play again on the match? Yeah, I expected more from Josh, right? He talks up golf. He talks about how it's his favorite thing in the world to do outside of playing football, and this guy wasn't that good. You know, I I thought he'd be better. I thought there were some rumors out there that he was an eight handicap, and if that's the case, like, I would have expected him to play better. Now, I'm sure that course is tough. I'm sure playing on national TV with those other guys and wanting to be great and people all around you, you know, worried about hitting them, all of that stuff 
certainly factors into your performance. But Josh, Josh was the third best golfer there. I think Pat Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers were clearly the best, then Josh, and then Tom Brady. And I'll say this about Tom Brady. Tom Brady was pretty good except for off the tee. I thought he struggled off the tee, but everything else was pretty decent. And as, looking at myself and the way that I play golf, which I've never done on national TV or with like crazy people around me, you know, I, I shoot like in the low 90s, low to mid 90s. And I felt like I had a chance of beating Josh Allen at golf if I had the chance. And this guy's supposed to have an eight handicap. So um, I, I do think that there's a good chance that Josh Allen will be back. I, I think that, you know, this is the cream of the crop quarterbacks in the NFL. And I think that's what the match wants. And so, you know, Tom Brady hasn't been good for three years on the match, and he keeps getting back on there. And I know that he's Tom Brady, right, and the GOAT and all that stuff, but I don't think Josh's performance precludes him from being back on the match in future years. Johnny says, obviously, every team has players that are making the roster, but what do coaches look for during training camp practices and preseasons and decide on, excuse me, What do coaches look for during training camp in preseason to decide on the bubble players? Is it simply execution and effort, and is it much more involved? It's a good question, Johnny, and I think three things factor in. Um, First of all, your developmental appeal as a player, you know, guys that you want to keep around, guys that show you some flashes that you want to tap into and see if you can develop them, right? So you're looking at some of those flashes, but you're looking at their physical skill, their size, their athleticism, and trying to understand what type of upward mobility this player has. And so you look for that physical skill and that talent, those flashes. You're looking for habits as well. How does this person approach the day? What is their energy like in practice? What is their energy like in the meeting room? Do they retain information? So habits, right? What type of habits do they have? What type of learnability do they have? And the number three is special teams. Can this player help us on special teams as they develop at their position. So I think those are the three differentiating things that are going to help you separate the bubble players. Developmental appeal, their habits, and their upside on special teams. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information. Find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship, the NHL, hockey conference finals, Major League Baseball, football's futures, and, of course, the latest fighting news from MMA to boxing and UFC. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to sign up and learn more about the trends and the action. It's Bet Online, and it's where the game starts. The next one today comes from Ernie, who says, how do scouts project a player's ceiling and potential? For example, how did scouts and yourself see that Mac Jones was already who he was versus Josh Allen, who had raw potential? I know Josh is an exception, but I'm curious how a team could pass over a great college player over someone with less production because of potential and ceiling. Really good question. And I think it's a really good two players to bring up, Mac Jones and Josh Allen. A lot goes into this, but I'll start with physical skill, right? Size, arm talent as a quarterback, athleticism, right? Like how good of an athlete are and what type of size do you have? If you have those physical gifts, those unteachable things, you get a lot more excited about how that player can evolve and grow and develop as a player. If you're kind of maxed out, right? You don't have a lot of explosive athleticism. For a quarterback, you don't have much in the way of arm talent. You're really relying on everything between the ears to be the reason why you execute. You have less physical skill, which means you have less options on the field. That really goes into it. So physical skill, traits, size, athleticism, arm talent, what type of physical skill do you have? And contrasting a Josh Allen to a Mac Jones is going to (laughs) favorably, I mean, emphatically favor a Josh Allen. The other part of this is time on task. And so you think about a player like Josh Allen who went to junior college and then to Wyoming, playing at a small, you know, smaller schools, lower level of competition, um, without a whole lot of time on task, right? Josh Allen didn't come into the NFL with thousands of passing attempts at the college level. Contrast that to a Mac Jones who 
came up in Jacksonville and went to all the quarterback camps and played college football at Alabama with the best players and against the best players. You know, you kind of feel that that player is a lot more maxed out, that you've you've learned as much as you're going to learn about them as a player and their skill level. Where with a Josh Allen, with you know, without that benefit of you know being trained as a quarterback his whole life, and then playing at a small school, a, a lower level of competition, there's just more room for upward mobility. There's less certainties about their projection. Whereas, hey, look, I've seen Mac Jones. He's trained his whole life for this. He's played with the best players against the best players. This is who he is. So it's funny. We've I've had some really good conversations with different people who scout players and have you know, important jobs in the NFL and those types of things. And we talked recently about how, you know, a lot of times that we do a really good job of applying the curiosity and intrigue. And, and we say things that like, this is a, a player with upward mobility because they went to a small school, right? This player went to a small school. They have untapped potential. What we don't do a good enough job of is, is the doing the, the opposite of that where, Oh, this guy went to a big school, played with the best players, had all the best things for them. The, the facilities, the nutrition, the coaching, everything they need to be a good player. And we don't factor that enough into our evaluation and understanding that, Hey, Maybe there's not a whole lot of room for upward mobility because they've had the same opportunity or they've had the best opportunity to showcase themselves. So we say, oh, small school, there's room for upward mobility, but we don't do a good enough job of saying, okay, this is a big school player and ha- they've had everything they need and that we should sort of dock them when it comes to our belief that they're going to grow and get better and develop. So there's some thoughts on that, uh, and I hope it, <laughs> I hope it answers your question. John says, what are your thoughts on Isaiah Hodgins? I remember when he was drafted, many considered him to be more of a surefire pick while Gabe Davis was the projection pick. I know he had injuries in his first few seasons, but what do you think are his chances at this point to make game day active rosters and be an impactful player for the Bills? Thanks for your work. Go Bills. Yeah, I wasn't in that camp. Uh, I like Gabe Davis a lot more than Isaiah Hodgins. I I recognize, you know, I did a full evaluation on, on Isaiah Hodgins coming out of Oregon State. He's got great hands. And he's tall, and um, I even think he's a good route runner when he's able to have free access from the slot. But Isaiah Hodgins, as a tall, linear-type player, he offers a lot of surface area at the line of scrimmage. It's hard for him to beat press coverage, and he doesn't necessarily have the athletic profile that's going to make corners cautious about being aggressive with him at the line of scrimmage. He's going to face contact early in every route that he runs in the NFL. He doesn't give you much after the catch, and he's just a tall, leggy guy, right? Like, that's hard for you to be a dynamic route runner when you're that type of size and you're high-hipped like that. So I think he's just got a lot of things working against him. And so you asked, what are the chances of him making game-day active rosters? I don't feel good about that at all. Uh, I, I have a hard time seeing his path to just making the roster, let alone dressing on on game days. I think he's a high character guy. He adds something um, you know, to the bottom of the depth chart, but I, I don't see Isaiah Hodgins getting to the point where he's making an impact for the Bills. And certainly the injuries don't help. I think this is a guy that in seven on seven or you know, just throw right running routes, throwing the ball, like Isaiah Hodgins is gonna look awesome. But when you introduce coverage, right, and, and players that are gonna be physical with him and players that are going to try to manipulate his routes. He's going to have a lot to overcome, and that's why I kind of struggle. And then you're talking about a bottom-of-the-depth chart receiver. Isaiah Hodgins does not project well to playing on special teams. So it's just tough for, for to find a path. And I know that that was kind of some harsh criticisms, but this is just me being honest about the dynamics and play with this player. Right? This is what he has to overcome, and it's a lot. And that's why I'm down on the possibility of him becoming a meaningful player for the Bills. Last one today comes from Jesse, who says, Listening to your Bill's athleticism pod made me wonder about this. Do you think Bill Belichick seeing Spencer Brown three times last year had any effect on his Cole Strange pick? Obviously, they both had very high high RAS scores. Clearly, the Bills got the better value with where Brown was picked, and I'm sure it wasn't the only factor, but I like to think that Bill was copying Buffalo a little bit and picking a highly athletic, if somewhat raw, offensive lineman. Yeah, this is this is tough for me to say for sure that Spencer Brown influenced this pick by the New England Patriots. It's such a weird situation, and I'm sure that you guys have all 
seen the criticism that the Patriots have faced for drafting Cole Strange in the first round. He's not a player that was widely viewed as a first-round player. Here's what's hard about it is I like Cole Strange. I think he's a good player. I think he would have been a great day-two pick. I think he's going to be a good starter for them. But it was just inappropriate and irresponsible value. And we'll never know. We'll never know how far Cole Strange would have slid. We'll never know at what point the Patriots could have gotten him. But obviously they believed in him and they wanted to have him and they had a big need on the offensive line and they still do. And I think Cole Strange is going to be a good player for them. But the value was completely irresponsible. And I don't, I don't know. I I, I have a hard time saying that Bill Belichick watched Spencer Brown and therefore was inspired to pick Cole Strange. I don't think there's a lot of correlation there. I think that Bill Belichick liked Cole Strange. He had a need on the offensive line. He's got a young quarterback that you don't want to get pressure in his face, and he liked the player, and he picked him. I think it's as simple as that. And time will tell, but I just feel like even if Cole Strange is, develops into one of the best offensive linemen in the NFL, I think you could have got him much later and helped yourself in other ways. Or you could have got a different player in the first round and then Cole Strange in the second or third round. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm not super high on the talent level of the Patriots roster at this point. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. Tomorrow, we should have plenty of updates coming out of Bill's OTA. So we will break all of those down on the podcast, have some fun stuff lined up for later in the week. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you're subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.